The two Vasara games arrived in arcades in the very early 2000s. Coming from Visco, a developer with a track record for making mostly bad video games, expectations weren't terribly high. But all reports suggested they had, somehow, managed to pull an absolute beauty from their previously rather sad and misshapen bag. Unfortunately, the games never made their way westwards, remaining Japan only, and despite receiving generous praise, have been, for the most part, somewhat forgotten and overlooked since. Until now, that is, with this Switch port, Cubite Interactive, who kindly supplied this copy of the game, are not simply dropping yet another shmup onto the Switch, they're bringing us a potentially significant piece of gaming history that's been borderline unavailable to most players for far too long. Now, as you're looking at this footage, and even when you start playing the game yourself, you'd be forgiven for asking, is this Psycho in disguise? And the simple answer is, yeah, kind of, but when the disguise is this good, who cares? There are definite similarities to some of Psycho's output here, but there are also more than enough differences and unique features to make Vasara absolutely its own beast, and the more you play, the less similar the games start to feel. Now the first thing that's going to strike you when you start Vasara is the setting. We ain't in outer space this time, boys. No, instead the action takes place in feudal Japan, with characters based on real historical figures. The vehicles our protagonists use to take on the samurai hordes, however, ought to give you a clue as to precisely how dedicated the developers were to historical accuracy. Hoverbikes, as far as I'm aware, were not in common use in Japan during the Sengoku era. Nor did Ieyasu Tokugawa and Oda Nobunaga, the big bad from Vasara 1 and 2 respectively, have spider tanks or robotic suits of armour at their disposal. However, they do here, and all that should concern you is taking them out using the not inconsiderable arsenal at your disposal. These tools and their setup are broadly similar in each game, but not identical. They're also not dissimilar to Gunbird 2, and if you've played that game, you should quickly feel at home. In Vasara 1, you have an autofire main weapon, a screen clearing bomb, a melee attack that requires a quick charge, and a more powerful attack, the titular Vasara, which requires a gauge to be filled by collecting gems. Notably, your melee attack can repel enemy bullets, and since it only takes a second or two to charge, can be used fairly freely. A really great little addition is the use of a light rumble to let you know when your melee shot is ready to be deployed. This attack deals significant damage, although only from close to medium range, and since you use it so often, makes Vasara a very attack-minded game. But it's the deflection aspect that really makes the game stand out, and gives it its own unique feel. Bullets come thick and fast, and you will need to use the bullet deflection, particularly during boss encounters, just to survive. Be careful though, your melee attack is not an all-encompassing shield, you can still get hit from the sides or behind when activating it. Something that makes surviving slightly easier, and I do mean slightly, is that touching enemies does not result in death. Instead you bounce off them, which, while it may not kill you immediately, will often do so moments later as you ping sideways into a hail of enemy bullets. You also have your Vasara attack, but this takes a long time to charge, sometimes as much as an entire stage, although it does dish out a huge amount of damage. This system is where we see the biggest change in Vasara 2. Here, bombs are done away with and replaced by an alternate Vasara system, which allows you to store up to three Vasara attacks for use at your leisure, and the gauges for these fill far more quickly than in the first game. This mixes things up nicely and allows the second game to feel quite distinct from the first while still maintaining a sense of continuity. Another difference between the two games are the number of sub-bosses. Most stages in Vasara 1 feature a mid-boss, but Vasara 2 features four per stage. Now these don't make it into a boss rush, there are still plenty of popcorn enemies buzzing around for you to wipe out, and these lieutenants can usually be taken down fairly quickly, but they do add a nice bit of character and sense of place to the game. This is further added to by the fact that literally dozens of smaller to mid-sized enemies in both games are individually named and come at you with their banners flying. Take them out and they will drop a blood-soaked nameplate, kind of like a medieval Japanese equivalent to dog tags, and you'll be rewarded with points bonuses at the end of the stage, depending on how many you took down. The point system, while not exactly complex, is certainly extensive. You can chain kills using your melee attack for combo multipliers, pick up gold, much of which is hidden behind destructible background elements, and graze enemy bullets all on top of the bonuses for picking up named enemies. The combo multiplier is another difference between the two games. In Vasara 1 it goes up based on how many enemies took out with a single melee attack then resets, whereas in Vasara 2 it continues rising throughout the stage. There are also lots of bonus items floating around, bombs, power-ups to your main shot and gems to refill your Vasara meter are constantly swirling around somewhere on screen. 
extra large gems like gold are often hidden in secret spots in the scenery. In the second game, gems are blue, but in the first game, gems are red and can get confused with the orange bullets as you're getting used to the game. Things can, in general, get very hectic at times, and there are moments when it can be a bit too easy to get lost in the mayhem. As mentioned, these orange bullets can be deflected with your melee attack, but Vasara 2 further differentiates itself by adding occasional purple enemy shots into the mix, which cannot be destroyed. Shots, by the way, are frequent, fast and manic, and I have to say, while I do know that all shmups are difficult, these arcade releases are really difficult. Just making your way past the three initial stages is a challenge, and the later stages ramp things up to insane levels, which will force you to master every attacking and defensive option you have. Now, in terms of presentation, this is very much a child of its time. But a good child, a smart one, with all their buttons done up correctly. By which I mean it looks pretty good. It has a consistent style with the enemies, despite their anachronistic weaponry, fitting the samurai era setting well, and backgrounds that progress in a pleasing fashion, telling in a way a little story as you move from villages replete with scurrying peasants, to castles and forts, and finally to a battlefield littered with dead bodies. One oddity more notable in the first game is that the developers really did go for a literal top-down aesthetic. Now, don't almost all shmups do that, you might ask, but not really, I'd reply. If you look at a lot of them, buildings, etc. are actually at an odd angle that, if you think about it, suggests almost all background elements are breaking limbo dance world records left, right and centre, but which gives designers more freedom to properly display the world. Here, as you fly over houses, you often are just looking down on literal rooftops, with little idea of what the buildings are like. This isn't exactly a problem, it's just something a little bit different. Characters too fit the aesthetic well, and kind of incredibly, every one of the sub-bosses in Vasara 2 has their own face tile, and the designers did a great job of maintaining variety despite the huge numbers they had to deal with. Sound too is another plus point, the music is reminiscent of Tengai's traditional Japanese style, but introduces an altogether more upbeat feel that I personally prefer. The slash of your sword is nicely done, but can grate a little when you hear it too much, but your main shots strike enemies with a satisfyingly deep thud and voiced bosses taunt you in hard-boiled Japanese. Basically, what we have here are two very solid arcade titles that had their releases not been hampered by considerations entirely unrelated to the games themselves, would no doubt be far more widely known than they currently are. Now, if you've been following this game on social media, you may be aware that Cubite Interactive were not just porting the two arcade games, they were also touting an entirely new multiplayer-focused widescreen mode called Vasara Timeless. My assumption was this would simply be a little rejigging of the main games, but what we actually have here is something altogether more noteworthy. This timeless mode is a hell of a lot of fun, and while it's not quite in the same vein as the arcade releases, there could be an argument made that this is essentially Vasara 3. I personally wouldn't go quite that far, but this is a very sizeable piece of content that adds a whole ton of value to an already packed collection. Timeless Mode operates in a kind of roguelike fashion, with enemies not coming in set patterns and rand randomised bosses from the first two games awaiting at stage end. You can also select from any of the characters, although in my opinion characters from Vasara 1 have a distinct advantage here due to the prevalence of bomb pickups. Bullets in this mode also move more slowly than in the arcade games, and you have an additional speed dash to get out of tricky corners. Initially it seems like an altogether more gentle experience, but it does get wilder the longer you last. It also has more modern visuals, with sparkling water and more highly defined assets. The backgrounds are far plainer than in the main games, though, and the scenes where bosses arrive is a real visual misstep, with the 3D render jarring horribly with the overall aesthetic. Somewhat to my surprise, this was actually the mode I'd probably spent most time with, which is great since it shows it's enjoyable and keeps you coming back, but unfortunately there is a less positive reason too. See, all three games have online rankings, but while timeless modes function exactly as you'd expect, the arcade leaderboards exhibit some serious flaws. You have one score per profile, and it is recorded no matter what settings you used, no matter what difficulty, how many lives or bombs you started with, and most criminally of all, no matter how many times you continued. Quick aside, you must beat the last stage using only a single credit, as continuing will return you to stage start, but this creates a scoring exploit, whereby you could just play the final stage a thousand times to inflate your score. This leaderboard issue is such a shame, as it spoils any element of competition, as you have no idea how others achieved their scores, although it's pretty obvious right now that all the top scores came from the credit view. Now, I spoke to a lead programmer from Cubite about this, 
and he has already come up with a fix for the final stage exploit and will look into possible other improvements post-release. Of course, I can only review what I have in front of me, but I have to say I was thoroughly impressed by the commitment to give players the best experience and I'm very hopeful we'll see a positive resolution to this issue. Other extras in the game have been better implemented, with a cool gallery featuring char character art and promotional images from the game's arcade releases, and in amongst the huge amount of options and settings you can choose from, perfect tatty mode support, allowing you to turn the screen either way at pretty much any point. One odd thing about the in-game menus is there is no quick restart, although a little trick I found was to simply leave your settings unchanged, then select apply, since this will take you back to character select. So overall, what we have here is a really nicely done package, and given that the Psycho games not only don't have online, but exhibit similar flaws even on their local boards, the scoring issue should be considered unfortunate rather than a deal breaker, especially when you consider the stupefyingly low price this collection is on offer for. There are multiple minor issues and that one glaring leaderboard issue, but the arcade games themselves are, I think, deserving of the moniker classics, and Cubite Interactive have brought them together in a collection that adds and expands on the originals in a really neat way. Despite the flaws, I'd give this collection a very strong 8.5 out of 10, but with the proviso that at the current price, and even when they go up to closer to $10, the value on offer here is absolutely incredible, and if you have even a remote interest in shmups or retro gaming, you need to put your phone or laptop down right now and pick these up. Seriously stop this video and go buy this collection. I've really enjoyed playing these games and I'm looking forward to getting to know each of the two arcade games in more depth individually. It's great to have another top tier pair of shmups to add to the library and I consider this to be a release of some importance. If you do pick them up let us know your thoughts below and I'll hopefully see you on the leaderboards. The patched and improved leaderboards. Alright, thanks for watching, see you next time, cheers.